We're now going to introduce the rather simple model at the heart of coordination dynamics. And it may seem to be a model that's about something no one would ever have cared of. It's a model based on finger wagging. But the preceding video gave you some insight into the motivation here, which is this is setting out to study coordination, not control. And the principles of coordination are held to be quite general and distributed throughout nature. So this is an investigation into an understudied aspect of basic um, coordination as found in all, at least biological systems, perhaps others. The model system involved has a backstory. It involves sitting around in a pub and discussing coordination. And there was an old ad for a phone book. Anyone remember a phone book? called the Golden Pages, which had an advertisement which said, let your fingers do the walking. Now, the coordination of the kind studied here is most evident in locomotion or in walking. And indeed, the hands can stand for this. Um, the model system involves two hands in its canonical form. It involves two hands wagging two fingers, either um, in one of two ways. So. The task requirement asks that the fingers be wagged at the same speed. That's the task requirement. So same speed. And when you do that, a little bit of experimentation on the bar stool can tell you very quickly that you have brought into being a system which has two distinct modes of organization. There's this one in which the fingers approach the midline together. This will be called the in-phase pattern, for reasons that will be clear. And this one, in which the fingers are in an anti-phase pattern. You can think of this as syncopation. It's like a ska beat. One is starting its cycle while the other is halfway through it. So those two modes, those two forms of organization, exhaust all the set of possible organizations. There's no third house. Try it for yourself. Use your hands and flap them. Can you flap? You can flap them like this in anti-phase, and you can flap them like this in in-phase, and there ain't no third way to stably flap them. Well, there's another characteristic of this model system that's of interest. And I just want to motivate this by your own observations of walking down the street. As you walk, if you speed up, walking becomes difficult. And there comes a point at which you reorganize everything into what we call a run. Now, in a bipedal animal, that's not as drastic or as obvious as it is in a quadruped, when a horse shifts from a walk to a trot to a gallop. Nonetheless, we, when we're locomoting, we can only walk over a restricted range of rates and to go faster than that, we have to undergo a functional reorganization, which we know as running. Now, something similar, some, not the same thing, but something similar, is evidenced by this system, where if we start in the in-phase mode and we speed up as fast as we can, and we can do this with metronomes and turn the knobs, uh, it gets difficult, but on the hands gets kind of stiffer, but you can keep it up as fast as you can reach. But if you start in the anti-phase mode, as you speed up, if you don't try and stop, resist it, the hands sort of spontaneously switch into the other mode, into the in-phase mode. This happens on the way up. There's no corresponding switch on the way down, which is different from the walk-run transition. If you run and then you slow down, you will have to shift back to a walk. So it's, it's different in that respect. But there is a rate-dependent transition from one form of functional organization to another. And that sets off lots of inquiry. So we've now developed an experimental model in which the system exhibits two stable modes at moderate speed. Those are the in-phase and anti-phase patterns. There's a rate-dependent transition to a single mode at fast rates, so that the in-phase pattern is somehow more stable than the anti-phase pattern. We don't get a corresponding transition as rate is reduced. And then, having done experiments initially, and since then thousands of experiments on this, um, some other features become evident. And one of these we've met before now in our brief overview of dynamical systems, which is that shortly before the system reorganizes 
from the antiphase to the in-phase mode, the variability in the relation of one hand to another shoots through the roof. We get critical fluctuations, as we've already seen. Um, the critical fluctuations are a key signature of a dynamic system which is reorganizing from one form of stability to another form of stability. We met that before. So this becomes then a model system for studying coordination which can be explored. Now, there's lots of prior art here. Um, we've met one before. We met the Rayleigh-Bernard convection, which undergoes a phase transition. It goes from being a homogeneous liquid in the presence of a temperature gradient to being an organized volume with alternating cylindrical rolls. We've met this as an example of a phase transition, and the kind of mindset going to understand this is trying to understand the functional reorganization through the lens and tools developed to study phase transitions in nature. Now, when we discussed the Rayleigh-Bernard convection, we noted that one way to describe this makes use of a thing called a potential function. This describes the set of attractors that are in the system, and its behavior around those attractors. So if you're looking at the graph on the right, lower right here, prior to the um, bifurcation, we see a phase, a single bowl-shaped potential function. What this means is that if you index the state of the system, you'll usually find it at the bottom of that bowl, and if you find it somewhere off that center, it's going to be moving towards the bowl. The bowl is an attractor in the classic sense. But at some stage, there's going to be a phase transition and the whole system is going to reorganize. And it's going to reorganize in one of two ways. These, <clears throat> the two possible ways it can organize look exactly the same, except that in one, each role, each role is going either clockwise or anticlockwise, and in the other, it's going the other way around. So one that's going clockwise is now going anticlockwise. So this, what we need is for the system to display a sort of a sensitivity such that it falls either into one basin of attraction or the other and then doesn't leave that. And that's shown with a potential function on the right-hand side in which the black ball indicates the state of the system and it's either on one side or the other side of this potential function. Now, it's a matter of mathematical trivia to construct a potential function like this the desiderata here are that it will be smoothly deformable, that it exhibit a single minimum for some parameter values, and then as we increase some parameter value, in this case equivalent to the temperature gradient, that it demonstrate this shift from a function with one minimum to a function with two minima. We've met this before. This is the kind of thinking that Scott Kelso was bringing to understanding the system of model coordination. And um, he describes at one stage how he met Hermann Haack, and it was at a conference, and it was a physics conference, so there was lots of potential functions and phase transitions in the air. And he described that he was interested in looking at interlimb coordination. And here's a, an initial, literally, back of a napkin sketch of what later on went on to become a mathematical model. You can see that he's toying around with the idea of something like a potential function that changes so that the little black ball, um, which starts in one of two minima, eventually ends up in the big minimum. This is not a developed model. This is, was literally done on a cocktail napkin <laughs> at that conference. It then led to discussion because this is the way physicists and engineers think, and it led to this long-standing collaboration between Hermann Haack and Scott Kelso, and I don't know the Bunce character, it seems to have disappeared from the literature, which gave rise to this model in 1985. It's usually referred to as the HKB model. The paper is not an easy read. It's short, but there's a lot of math, but I'm going to lead you through the principal moves made. There's a strategy that these guys are following. First, what they do is they look at the system as a whole, and they observe how to most concisely and precisely describe it. So the single system is found in one of two states. Um, that gives it one degree of freedom. So you're either going to be in one state or you're going to be in the other state. 
That's at the system level. Now we're going to distinguish the role of the components in the system. So the overall behavior is an emergent, like the pinwheel with the puppy dogs. But now we need to ask about the components, the individual puppy dogs. And each of these is, of course, one limb. And while the limb can do an awful lot of things, in the context of this task, it behaves in a very simple fashion. Each limb goes through a, sing a, a repeating cycle. So it's an oscillator, which we're going to represent with some kind of periodic function. And an oscillator, each individual oscillator, has two degrees of freedom, its position and its velocity. So at the component level, we've got four degrees of freedom. At the system level, we've got one degree of freedom. The move made in the paper is to do the mathematics to come up with the coupling function that allows us to derive the one, the one degree of freedom system from the four degree of, of freedom system. So we're going from a description in terms of multiple parts and showing how we can characterize the coupling, the non-independence between these parts in order to arrive at a concise, more concise description of the overall system behavior. Having got those pieces in place then, this allows for considerable elaboration, extension, refinement, and so on. But the HKB the original HKB paper did this move. It describes the component level, it describes the system level, and it shows how one derives from the other through the specification of the form of coupling between oscillators. Now, these degrees of freedom suggest that we need a state space. Um, the state space for an oscillator, as we've seen, is uh, much like our pendulum. We want to say where it is in its cycle, so its phase, and how fast it's going. Uh, so we've got a phase measurement for one oscillator and a phase measurement for the other oscillator. And when they're moving in sync like this in the in-phase pattern, each hand is tracing out the same phase position within its own cycle. So the relative phase, which is the phase of one minus the phase of the other, is constantly zero. They have the same relative phase. Whereas in the antiphase pattern, one hand is starting its cycle while the other is already halfway through its cycle. So they display a relative phase of a half a cycle. Now, this gets represented as usually either with pi or with one half. There's two notations available. But you get the idea, I hope, that the two stable modes can be described with a single number, which is relative phase, which describes the phase difference between the phases of the two oscillators. So here I've shown you what turns out to be an incredibly fruitful way to think of phase, not now thinking in terms of mathematics and sinusoids. That's where the word comes from. That's the formal definition is your position within a sinusoidal cycle or your position going around a circle. But look at the relationship between the bear and the fish there. Now, the right moment for the bear to catch the fish is not given in seconds. The right moment for the bear to catch the fish is when the fish is right there. The right moment for the fish, the, 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 for, if the fish were to want to get eaten, the right moment to be there was when the bear's head is there. The catching of the fish happens when the two processes, fish and bear, are meaningfully aligned. And this notion of meaningful temporal alignment of one thing with respect to another is the guiding image underlying studies of coordination. And it takes us into a view of time appropriate for the living, which is uh, has to do with things that themselves are going about their business and that then form into patterns of mutuality. If Kronos is the god of time expressed in clocks, Kairos is an old Greek word for this kind of relative time. So we're going to dive into the paper, the 1985 paper. The first thing is we need to model the joint behavior, that's the behavior of the two fingers or the hands, we can do this in many ways, uh, as a single system. And We've just gone through this. The relative phase, which is the phase of one hand minus the phase of the other, gives us a single number, which allows us to clearly and meaningfully distinguish between the in-phase and the anti-phase pattern. So the relative phase here is the difference between two phases. It's a good number to choose because it captures the overall state of the system. 
there's a bit of jargon here. Sometimes a number like this that captures the overall state of a system is referred to as a collective variable for reasons that I hope are insightful. And sometimes it refers to, confusingly, I think, as an order parameter. I don't like this, that there's so many terms out there. I'll try to use collective variable because I think it's the more insightful term. Now, we've just characterized the behavior of the system as a whole, and now we need to come up with some kind of potential function which makes clear the presence of one or two attractors. Um, so this potential function shown here for nine different values of a single parameter has the following characteristics. It's symmetric about zero. Um, it's defined over the relative phase. So in this case, it's going from minus pi to pi. Notice that minus pi in a circular variable is the same thing as pi. So there's, there's a wraparound thing going on here. So that the version of the function shown in the top left hand corner has actually two minima one at minus pi and pi that's one minimum and one at zero and the one at zero is deeper now we we've got a parameter which we can change they're given as b over a we'll come back to that as we change that the depth of the smaller attractor reduces until eventually it goes away and it becomes a hill and then there's only one attractor left in the middle. So this is a simple means of parametrically varying the shape of this function to move it from a position of two attractors to a position of one attractor. Now the way mathematicians do this is they take out their Lego box and they look in there and they say how do I build something like this and they go ah cosines. Cosines are sinusoids of various kinds. The simplest function you can build basically, that has these properties, is there given as v of phi. It's minus a cos phi minus b cos 2 phi. So the cos phi has the slower cycle, the slower period, and the cos 2 phi is, a, is a, um, a, a sinusoid with twice the frequency. Add those together and you get exactly this. And then if you vary the ratio of a over b, this function moves smoothly from the 2 attractor form to the one attractor form. So this is the potential function, which captures the notion of um, the state in both the in phase, both in situations in which there are two attractors available to the system and in situations in which there's only one attractor. That's part one of the modeling exercise. Part two of the modeling exercise now is to model the components and we said each component is an oscillator, so it's going to have two degrees of freedom. Well, they've got oscillators in their Lego box here as well. There's lots of oscillators. We've seen some already. Um, in order to choose among the various oscillators in the toolbox, one thing they did was they measured a hand moving at various speeds. And it's curious if you measure, if you speed up a wagging hand like this, as you speed up, it gets stiffer. Seems to just, that's just what happens. Uh, so the amplitude of the oscillation decreases as it gets stiffer. Now, looking in the toolbox, we find two oscillators in there, the Van der Poel and the Rayleigh, and neither of them quite match the data. So shown on the graph here, the hybrid is an approximation to empirical data obtained from one hand, and it's kind of a mixture of one and a mixture of the other. So what did they do? They came up with a model that sort of combined these two oscillators. We don't have to deal with the equations. You'll be glad to know. Um, what we're shooting for is to get the emergence of the two-hand system with its two modes um, by starting with two individual oscillators. The state space of one is shown on the left, the state space of the other is shown on the right. And by putting an appropriate coupling function, we want the overall system to collapse to a simpler description. Very abstractly. And in terms that we've met before, one hand, system one there, is going to have a definition in terms of a differential equation for an oscillator. The second hand is going to be modeled in exactly the same way. It's its own oscillator. And then we're going to write a coupling function. We've seen this before on the right hand side in which the state of the first one is influenced not only by its state, but by the state of the other. And we're actually going to make this coupling symmetric 
So in our previous example of coupling, we left open the possibility of asymmetrical coupling, but here the function g is going to be the same on both sides. So now we've got a, a rather complex description of two oscillators which are interacting, and we've got a, a utopian vision of a very simple description of this system. There then follows some mathematical wizardry, which I am not going to attempt to reproduce. The maths is non-trivial. But working through the maths, you can go from the complicated description on the left-hand side to the simple potential function on the right-hand side. You can show how, by with the appropriate coupling function, the four degree of freedom system can be re-described as a one degree of freedom system. And this only is ever going to work if we've captured the basic characteristics of the oscillators individually and their coupling. So we end up with a model which has various layers to it. And these recur in throughout coordination dynamics. This is a pattern that gets repeated again and again. We start off with some phenomenon which comes into being in the presence of specific boundary constraints. So there's a task here. The task is to oscillate the fingers in a given fashion. Um, the given fashion being maintained frequency and a metronome signal will be provided. Right. Um, we define the collective variable, which is the relative phase, which captures the overall state of the system. And we describe uh, its observed forms using a potential function. We then turn down a level to the level of components, which are modeled as, in this case, nonlinearly coupled oscillators. And we show how the collective variable and the component level um, interoperate. So those basic strategic steps are repeated again and again in coordination dynamics. That's the hard part. Now we're just going to see in the next video where that goes after you've done that basic work.